name is Nicholas Andrade. I'm a senior at Dighton Rehoboth High School. Today is a part of a series of interviews that local students will be conducting with past teachers, administrators, and students who share memories of Rehoboth uh, schools. Today is February 21st, 2012, and I'm here interviewing Russell Latham. Hello, I'm Russell Latham. I'm a past teacher and administrator at the Rehoboth Schools, Dighton Rehoboth Regional School District, School Union 37. There's a complication for you. And um, I'm here to answer questions and uh, interview and uh, enjoy a nice afternoon. All right, uh, Russ, could you explain to us uh, the details of your career exactly? <laughs> yes, I can do that. Um, and it'll also uh, be a little longer story than most people want to listen to, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I came to uh, teach at Rehoboth in 1962. Uh, Robert T. Roy was superintendent of the schools and hired me uh, to teach special education at Palmer River School, uh, where David Smith was a principal. And um, at that time, uh, the school district was in School Union 37, Dighton Rehoboth, Berkeley, and Gosnold, and a regional high school, Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School, grades 9 to 12. Um, so I began teaching uh, a class of about six teenage special needs boys at Palmer River School. Mrs. Morris taught the girls next door, uh, and um, Palmer River was a grade one to grade six elementary school. Um, then later on, um, I, um, the first year we went to the high school. We sort of bargained and conjoled our way into uh, having our teenage boys be at the high school with all of their teenage peer, uh, peers. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> that, was a, that was a great experience and a great year. And Joe Harrington was, um, principal of the high school of his famous reign as principal of Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School. And I taught there for a year, uh, went on to what I thought was going to be an opportunity in Brockton that didn't turn out to be an opportunity. I was able to come back the following year, um, taught at the high school until about 1972 or so, um, when <clears throat> My coordinating of special, when I came back from Brockton, I became the coordinator of special education, as well as my teaching job. In about 1972, it became a full-time administrative job as we kept growing special education over all of those years. And, um, <clears throat> and then from, uh, from there, um, the whole special needs program kept growing and growing and growing, and it, so it became a a full administrative position, central office. After I had an office at uh, Beckwith School, I had an office at Anawan School, and I had an office up at the up at the high school in the superintendent's office. Um, and then in 1988, uh, opportunity came when Dighton Rehoboth uh, regionalized uh, K to 12 instead of just 9 to 12, and um, Dighton and Rehoboth became the district that they are today, and Berkeley and Gosnell was set afloat on their own, and I became superintendent in Berkeley and Gosnell, what was left of School Union 37. And in fact, um, <clears throat> I was superintendent there for about seven years, went back to being a special ed director in Easton, Massachusetts, and during all of that time, I met still in my retirement, part-time superintendent of the schools in Gosnold. Gosnold is the Elizabeth Islands off of uh, New Bedford and Cape Cod. And my one-room schoolhouse is on Cuddyhunk Island. Wow. Sounds like you've done a lot. <laughs> uh, do you remember your first classroom? Yes, I do. I remember it well. It's down the right-hand turn, go in Palmer River School, get in the main corridor, take the right, go straight on down, walk right into the classroom. <clears throat> That's where I started with a half a dozen teenage boys, and um, we had a, a great first year, I think. Um, we did uh, some great bulletin boards that uh, the kids were pretty talented with their drawing and 
whatever, and we did bulletin boards. Uh, we raised, uh, one of the things I like to tell all the time is we raised chickens uh, in the classroom, uh, and we, um, after they got up to about, we, we raised them in, a, in one of those uh, sand tables, you know, mm-hmm. and we put a cage on it, and, um, and after they got pretty, some feathers coming and everything, we put the chickens outside, and it was right outside the superintendent's office window. And we were raising chickens out there. And um, we started in the spring of the year. And just before school closed, uh, we had a barbecue. We, uh, had a, I had a friend uh, named Ed Tessier in town who had been running a turkey farm. And he helped us uh, slaughter and clean chickens. And then uh, we went across the street to one of my students' houses and had a barbecue. Um, so I think we learned a little something about the reality of uh, the grocery store. <laughs> what was the best and hardest aspects of being an administrator? Hmm. Well, it's the best, the best parts, uh, I think, why some people like me just as soon get involved is because you have a chance to uh, help to stir the broth. You have a, a chance to... Uh, uh, make the cake. You have a chance to um, help things happen, mm-hmm. um, and um, so that's that's really the good part. And the, and the tough part is is um, very closely married to another one of the good parts, and that is uh, working with people. And so working with people is great, and working with people sometimes is your biggest struggle um, to get things to happen to do the politics of it, to uh, sell programs. Uh, I happen to be involved um, over the whole growth of special education. And um, um, I hadn't been in the program very long when the state of Massachusetts put in Chapter 766, uh, which was the, uh, the lead program for the country. Uh, since then, uh, the federal government put in a program. Uh, and. Um, the only problem with them all is that they never funded as much as they have the dream of what you can accomplish, but the funding pile is never as great. And in some ways, that becomes sort of the third major administrative problem, and that is always, uh, always battling for funds, always trying to have enough funds to get the job done that everybody wants done, uh, including yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, want, you want all of the good things to happen, and um, but it takes nothing happens like that and so you have to you have to do the sales job and you have to fight for budgets and all of those kinds of things but you get the nice pleasure when something really happens uh, that you've been dreaming about so we went from when I first became a coordinator here uh, in special ed while I was still in the classroom we started with four of us teachers I can't give you the number of staff member there was when I left uh, the whole school district union because I can't remember. But on top of that, Rehoboth was only a, was a piece of that. Mm. And um, we went from those four teachers to uh, teachers, speech therapists, occupational therapists, um, physical therapy, um, a fairly large number of uh, school psychologists that were running uh, evaluations and, and parent meetings and all of those kinds of things. And, uh, and uh, probably another five or six uh, across the whole school union of uh, adjustment counselors. Mm-hmm. Um, learning disabilities came on while I was in, early on while I was in. Uh, people didn't know much about it. Uh, they misplaced kids into programs for retarded children and children with limited abilities. Um, and so along came the whole knowledge and, of uh, learning disabilities. And uh, I had the first learning disability teacher to do that job at Palmer River School named Mrs. Fitzpatrick out of Taunton. She had been a reading expert and a first grade expert. And uh, I hired her near the end of her career, and she did a great job for those kids that she served then, and she also helped lead the way for how 
learning disabilities would be served in a school district. So a lot of things happen uh, over the course of time. Um, it was an exciting time. I was sometimes accused of stealing all the town's money um, to get those jobs done, but um, I think we serve kids very well. Still do. There's a lot of what a lot of what was started way back then is still going on today. You really came on during a big movement, a big yes, change. Yes, that's right. That's right. Very impressive. Um, at what schools did you teach? I taught at Palmer River for that year. Mm -hmm. And then I taught uh, my one year away was at Brockton High. But then back here at Dayton Rehoboth Regional High School, I taught until I became a full-time administrator. So it was just two two in town, Palmer River and and the high school, but when my office was located at Beckwith School, felt like the same kind of thing, except I didn't have a classroom. But it was, uh, Mr. Lucier was across the hall being the principal of the school and, and running the school, but um, I was running the district-wide programs from what is now the, or what was before they put that addition on, the last addition, but it, that was the guidance offices where I had my little office. And uh, where ex where were you an administrator exactly? Like, Where was I an administrator? Yes. Right, right here in Rehoboth and then across that school union and at, and at the high school. Um, in this interview process for the history of Rehoboth and that kind of thing, it's Rehoboth and then, uh, but I've also been the administrator over in uh, Berkeley and Gosnold and then in the town of Easton, uh, just before my retirement for the last six years, I was special ed special services director in Easton. You've been very busy. How and why did you become a teacher exactly? <laughs> well, I fit uh, what uh, quite a few kids, uh, I think, fit. Uh, not, it, not that I think it's the nicest thing. I, I really like hearing, uh, I got a grandson right now that uh, has wanted to be a teacher. He's only in the seventh grade. I don't know if it will happen, but he's wanted to be a teacher since he was in kindergarten and and uh, and actually probably preschool. And um, I've seen other people like that, and I've interviewed and hired people like that. But me, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> uh, when I was leaving high school, I thought I, uh, I hadn't had a screamingly wonderful high school uh, academic career. I uh, had a lot of involvement. I was in the high, Taunton High School Cadet Corps and um, some of those kinds of things and did a lot of church stuff and whatever. So I was an active enough guy, but <clears throat> my uh, scholarly stuff wasn't all that great. So then I, I tried to, back then you tested into colleges. Uh, you didn't do the big blanket tests like they do now. So, so I tried to get into Mass Maritime Academy and I passed all those tests and I was headed for there, I thought, until they found out that I have a certain amount of color blindness. And um, so they said no. Afterwards, I found out from friends who went there, about three or four friends went there, <clears throat> and they found out that if I had probably pushed it, I could have maybe ended up in the engine room. Uh, but of course, they didn't want me out on the deck uh, they'd be able to hide those ships <laughs> out there someplace with, the, uh, with the, my color blindness problem. So I ended up then, um, um, I wanted to go to school because all my friends went, were going to go to school, I guess, as much as anything else. And so I, went, I took the test over at Bridgewater. And, um, and so I, I got in there too. And I uh, actually went there. And I... Um, I changed majors early on um, from a math science kind of major because I tested into it. That was another thing. I mostly decided that because I tested into it. Um, and then um, I changed it to earth science. And I went through college, including my teacher training. Um, back then, there's another thing we're probably going to talk about. But back then, they did teacher training about a quarter quarter of a year in the junior year in, the, on the camp, in a campus school, and then a quarter of the year out in a community school somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so 
I got all the way through all of that, um, and um, I was doing my senior training at Kohanet School in Taunton. And all the special ed programs were in the basement of Kohanet School in uh, Taunton. And I used to spend all my extra time, uh, any time that I could, that I wasn't already teaching uh, science or whatever else in the eighth grade, uh, in the basement of the school with the special ed programs. And I saw what I thought was some absolutely wonderful teachers doing wonderful work with handicapped children. And I saw some stuff, some teaching and going on that I thought was even I could do better. <laughs> and so um, when I started looking for a job, um, back then there was t special ed teachers were such a shortage that um, I applied anyway when there was a special ed opening. And um, I ended up with uh, a choice between a job down on the Cape, down in Orleans, and a job here in Rehoboth. Uh, and... Um, the one in Orleans was a one, one year deal filling in, and the one in Rehoboth was, if I made it, <laughs> it was a permanent job. So I came to Rehoboth with Robert T. Roy. And was it uh, the change in the, the change in uh, the need for education for special education that prompted you to become an administrator? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, since it, it was sort of the enlightened time about everybody with a handicap and whether they were going to be left home or sent home, um, I came along when there were still students in this town that had been sent home. That's it. That was the answer to the educational problem. If they, if they didn't, if they couldn't be controlled in school or if they had pulled off some kind of stunt or they... And, and they seemingly, you know, didn't have all the capabilities to do school. They were sent home. See you later. Oh, wow. um, so that kind of, that basic, you know, that gets you attention. <laughs> and so we didn't want, we certainly didn't want those extremes to happen. And then uh, since I was there, like I said a few minutes ago about uh, learning disabilities, since I was there and some of the kids in my actual class, um, were much uh, overall brighter, but had, couldn't read. Um, and, and so what's the blockage and what do we know about that? And back then we didn't know a heck of a lot, but um, still didn't need to mislabel people, kids, uh, students, and, um, and you needed to um, find a way to unlock the problem if possible. And so, um, you know, Somebody had, somebody had to be advocating, somebody had to be battling, somebody had to be uh, uh, trying to keep up to the latest thing and see what we could do that was uh, going to serve our kids well. Because it makes kids, makes kids happier. They're going to live a happier life. They don't think they're so stupid when they can finally learn something. Their parents nearly jump off the yard arm somewhere thinking that something is wonderful. So once you get by the blockage of having a special program or a special label or the word special at all, if you can get by that, most of the time it's a good thing. It's like, do you want to go to the doctor's office? Not everybody wants to run right down there for a doctor's appointment, you know? Yeah. But if he's going to fix your broken leg or your abscessed foot or something, you know, mm. you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> and you want it fixed. And when it is, you're happy. <laughs> so that's about the same kind of thing that happens when Kids have handicaps. Nobody really wants to think that that's going to happen. But so sometimes it's a struggle to work with the parents and the rest of the family that really are disappointed and having a tough time with it and all of that to actually offer help and have something happen. But it's worth it. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good that you help them out and help them overcome their labels and mm -hmm. taught them. Um, how were you trained for your job? Were you just thrust in or did you actually get trained with somebody? I did a combination of both of those things. I was thrust in because 
I really wasn't special education trained when I started my job. The good part of that, I'll take the second half first, sort of. The good part of that was that I started doing my master's degree right away and, and was in special education. And um, so um, I sort of had a live experiment going on at the same time I was learning at night, uh, going to classes and, and uh, working with the kids in the daytime. And so that wasn't, that wasn't too bad and it wasn't like you were just running totally by the seat of your pants because I could ask the professor at night and I could ask the regular you know, principal anyway and that kind of thing. So that wasn't too bad. The rest of my training was a little bit like I mentioned before. Uh, back then they were uh, pretty much the, the training that you got was lectures in class with some how to do it classes, not too many of those. Most of them were just like all the rest of the liberal arts colleges, but some, a few were a little more specialized. But then when you did your junior practice teaching, usually in the lab school on campus, they drilled the heck out of you about how to teach. Um, and you, back then, they would teach six of us together in one classroom. I, the, the, <laughs> the teacher that was in charge of that room had, had one heck of a job to pull off. She had a full classroom of kids in front of it to act like a regular teacher about. Then she had a half a dozen uh, students from the college, all juniors, uh, trying to learn how to teach. And so between trying to shuffle all of those six people into actually doing some teaching and then making sure that those kids in that classroom were really kind of get what they were supposed to get, mm -hmm. it was like, uh, I'm sure that job was... They were they were like associate professors or whatever, but man, they had a they had a whopping teacher job to to pull that off. Um, and then as senior, <clears throat> you went out into the community into a regular situation and practice taught. Now I did both of those things, but I did them for regular classroom. So then when I made the switch over and got my first job in in special ed, I really was thrust into it. But I did have the teaching, general teaching stuff from regular ed. Mm -hmm. And then I picked up uh, some extra kind of goodies from the professors at night. So did you actually, um, had you ever really like sat down with a special education class before other, other than your first time teaching? No. No. <coughs> No, I didn't. I had only observed a lot um, and did the regular ed thing and then started right in with my coursework at the same time that I was starting in on my job. So I had, I had good consultants, let's say, um, and um, some, sometimes they were, you know, just the principal down the hall, David Smith, or, uh, or the special ed teacher in the next room, Mrs. Morris. So I had I had people if I needed them, um, and the professors at night. So I had pe people to coach me if I if I needed it. But a whole bunch of it just, in some ways, came pretty natural. Um, you know, you're not. Te I wasn't teaching a subject subject matter that was overly specialized. You know, I was teaching some very basic. Um, education stuff, some math and some reading and whatever. Uh, one of the things I found out was that some things seemed to go along all right that way. Some other things like reading, um, I'm no reading expert, and um, <clears throat> reading seemed to, during my time, be a, a mixture of finding out about learning disabilities and reading and finding out that a lot of people are s still learning that stuff today to really unlock all of the different ways kids learn to read, especially that language stuff, mm -hmm. reading and all that goes with it. And so many people learn in so many different ways that you, as a teacher, if you're going to, you sometimes really need a specialist in that area to work with kids. Now, in lots of other cases, you can do whole classrooms of kids and you get the right you get the right uh, textbooks and you get the right presentation by the teacher and 
if all of the kids in that classroom are learning by a similar style, you'll do pretty good. If four of those kids in that classroom are learning by a different style, they're going to struggle, and it might not be that they um, couldn't learn by just a different style. It wasn't in Rehoboth, but it was in one of our communities in Union 37. That <clears throat> This is off my, not my first year, but when I started being a coordinator and we were doing learning disabilities, and there was a big charge on for um, <clears throat> um, learning with the phonetic method. Because like in my, t my era, I got a lot of look and s look say. And then later, and before that, my mother's era was phonics. Mm -hmm. And if people do the same argument even up until today, uh, which way is the better way to teach reading? And the phonetic way wins by about 60% of the people. About 40% or maybe 30%, depending on the groups you're looking at. They, l they learn better actually by sight. And you pull the sound along with it, but the lead thing is sight. And the other kids, the lead thing is sound, and you bring the vision stuff along with it. Mm -hmm. So we had just gone through a big era of everybody's pushing phonics, and we were getting a ton of referrals for special needs evaluations. So one year we were able to convince the principal of that school <coughs> to get one reading set that was visually oriented. And we had the teachers select the kids. And we didn't have hardly any referrals the following year because you approached it with the style that they needed to learn by. And they never needed a special needs label. They just needed to get taught by the right approach. And so when you're getting started off the duff, like you asked me about, um, and you just get thrown in, you miss some of that stuff because you just don't know enough to, to um, be selective and choose programs that really match right. kids. So anyway, that's a long story about where special ed is. And um, how were you trained for your administrative job position? <coughs> In a similar way that I was uh, for my uh, first special ed job, actually. Uh, taken my master's degree and so I ended up doing those two things, special ed and administration in, in a combination and so by the time by the time I was getting my foot into um, doing a little bit of uh, supervising other teachers and whatever, I had got my master's degree so at least I I had administrative training in, in a college setting degree program but as far as doing it Nowadays, they uh, have intern programs for administrators. Back then, they basically didn't have, have that. And so you got trained and you got a certificate by the state that you had had the right courses and that kind of stuff. So a la, you should be able to do the job because you've had the right coursework. Right. Um, and so that's the way I got it. And then the rest of it was really on the job, practical training and and you don't usually do your first administrative job um, independently, you know? So there was principals of schools around that I had to work with to do, help lead the special needs program. It's one of the unique things about administration in special ed. You, you're supposed to pull off a lot of stuff in other people's kingdom. Uh, of, principals of schools, uh, a friend of mine, still a friend of mine today, that we had a little rocky beginning together when he came to the system. And um, that was because he told me within a few months when we were getting together and solving problems yeah, that he had just got through being trained to be prince of his building. And who's this guy that comes into his building and um, has some thing to say about supervision of some of his staff? Um, who's, you know, who's leading programs inside of the, his walls and on, in his door. Uh, so that's one of the things you have to pull off. But in doing that, you learn from everybody. You know, you learn from all of those principals. And then you have a, have a direct supervisor called the superintendent of schools. 
And so, if lots of times you any anything you're going to do, it's probably questionable administratively, or you're selling a program, or you're getting a budget, or whatever. You're going to be bouncing that off your boss, and so you're going to get all those interactions, and and that's training. If you don't do it right this time, you lose. <laughs> you do it. You try another way the next time, and you win. Okay, you learn something. I'm sure your background as a teacher helped you out learning what the kids needed. <clears throat> yeah. Yep, that, that's absolutely true. Teacher, teacher things and human being things, and what we all what we all collectively learn when we go through life, and um, a whole bunch of it is um, whether you're in the schoolhouse, whether you're in the church whether you're in the Lions Club, whether you're in your family, the extended family. <laughs> There's so much about life that's so similar. Um, when there's a tough time, some people get all upset and can never talk to anybody again. And somebody else can put your arm around you and say, come on, let's talk about this and get rid of this problem. And so there's so many things that are sort of no big secret about life even though it's called school administration instead of administrating the office at this insurance company. You still have a lot of people to work with. And you want to get a job done and you don't want to fight and all of that. So very similar. So if you're dealing with most of life pretty good, you could probably deal with school life pretty good. Mm. And um, what, where did, which years did you teach? <clears throat> Well, I taught 62, 63 at Palmer River School. And then I uh, taught 63, 64 at Dighton Rehoboth High School. Then I away, went away for 64, 65, and came back to Dighton Rehoboth. And then uh, I think it was, I think it was about 1972 that I went from um, teaching at the high school being their first golf coach, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's another little fun story. Uh, and until um, 1972, when I became full-time special education coordinator, I think was the first title, um, and then director, and then special services director, because we added nurses and psychologists and all of those uh, specialties to the special needs special services department, kind of, and I managed, managed that. So that was till 72, and then I um, saw so our special ed director here until 88, when the school system changed, and I went to Berkeley Gosnold as the superintendent. And uh, which year did you retire? I retired in 2001 from Easton Public Schools, uh, Special Services uh, Director. And um, I maintained my uh, part-time job as uh, superintendent of schools in, in Gosnell still today. It's a little, it's a small part-time job, but keeps my finger in it. And it's kind of fun. Right now we have uh, two students in our one-room schoolhouse and one young man teacher who is wonderful and, uh, and have another um, one, two, three, four kids, uh, high school kids uh, that are all tuitioned out because we don't have a high school on the island. So I still keep the dabble in it and still did, even though it's very small, you still have a school committee, still do budgets still have to manage the kids that are tuitioned out and make sure that they're getting what they're supposed to get and pay the bills and all of that. So I retired in 01, but I still have my finger in it. Still maintaining a positive influence. I hope so. The school committee and I seem to get along pretty well, so. That's good. <laughs> yep. Uh, which schools did you attend as a child? I uh, was a Taunton kid, and so I um, attended Caleb Bonham School, which was right in my neighborhood. So I 
walk to school over there, and I reminds me somewhat of my one-room schoolhouse in Gosnell because the kids walk in, back and forth and walk home to lunch and that kind of thing, like the city schools do, mm -hmm. more than the country schools. But um, it was the same school my mother went to, and um, my friend lived down sort of in the backyard, and so it was kind of a friendly place to go. I had the same first grade teacher my mother had. Uh, oh, wow. And uh, and the principal of the school, too, I think, was the same same one. And um, one of my favorite teachers, uh, probably of all time, was the fifth grade teacher there, Mrs. Driscoll. Driscoll. And um, so that was nice. I started playing a little bit of uh, clarinet and saxophone there. And, Used to have to walk down to the middle school um, to band days, and that was another half a mile, uh, not quite a mile, I guess, away. And that's where I went to um, uh, middle school, grammar school, for grades seven and eight. Most of the kids that went there went for grades six, seven, and eight. So. Those of us who came from Caleb Bonham had to fit in after we got there because we were only, you know, 30 of us or 25 or whatever the number was um, to fit into all of the other classes that had already been there. So there'd be about two of us per class. <laughs> or I felt, felt a little lonely for a while uh, until I got used to that. And um, band things got stronger then and... Um, and uh, we used to ride my bike, and I did a paper route for six years, 100 papers, um, all the way down Ware Street in Taunton. And anyway, after I graduated from the eighth grade at Cohannet School, I went to Taunton High School, uh, the old Taunton High School over where Morton Hospital is today, and graduated in 1958. And... Uh what are you doing today? Uh, I got a long list of things. My wife thinks it's too long. <laughs> uh, anyway, I have my part-time job at Gosnold. I'm active in the Rehoboth Lions Club and have been for about 46 years. Um, but also, I'm active in the congregation, Rehoboth Congregational Church. Um, because of I'm still involved in school, I'm still on a board of directors of uh, PCC, um, Project Contemporary Competitiveness, that's a big mouthful, um, that runs that nice summer program for uh, high school kids in uh, southeastern Massachusetts. We just moved it from uh, Bridgewater to Stonehill. Uh, it'll be in Stonehill for its second year. It's a wonderful program uh, for kids in the eighth and ninth grade. Um, in Rehoboth, Dighton Rehoboth belongs. It's wonderful. Um, and um, I'm still on the board of directors of Cooperative Production, uh, serving uh, handicapped adults in Dighton Rehoboth, uh, Taunton, Berkeley, Norton. Um, has his main offices in uh, Dighton on uh, Somerset Avenue, uh, the old Princess House building. Um, uh, what else? It seems like there's a couple other things that um, uh, I have a family. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, pretty neat. I got six grandchildren and three kids, and they have wives. And that's one happy bunch. That's good. I still have my mom, who's now in a going into the nursing home, and so that's another stress of life dealing with the change. My mother-in-law's in the same nursing home. We got our hands full with that at the moment. And um, what else? Oh, we, got a, we have a shack in Maine uh, on a lake where we hide out not enough. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I can't think of anything else important to say at the moment. Yeah, anything's important. <laughs> Is the school, the Taunton School District, different now than from when you were a kid? Taunton? Hmm. Yeah, it is. Um, 
they have their new high school that's now just completed a big renovation. Um, and um, uh, they have a relatively new superintendent of schools, a nice lady that came down from Maine and uh, do seemingly doing a nice job there. Um, my, I have two of my grandchildren going to school in Taunton. And they seem to be doing okay. One, uh, they've been redistricting, which is, and they have a somewhat of a controversy around. They just decided all their eighth graders would go to the high school, and so that has some ripples going on about it. Uh, but in general, Taunton has done a pretty good job over the years in uh, in their school system. What grades are your grand grandkids in? Uh, first grade and seventh grade. That's nice. Yeah, it is nice. They're good. They're doing good. They're lucky. They're doing well in school too. Would you? What is your stance on the eighth graders going to the high school? Would you want to see your grandchild going to the high school? Well, it's sort of not my first choice, but I certainly think it's workable. Um, it's a little bit like the discussion when uh, we put. Um, um, made uh, Beckwith School when it was built a real, uh, I call it a real middle school, grade five through eight, because that's what a real middle school is, even though when towns are, when cities and towns get in trouble or have trouble housing their kids, you know, they need a, another building, they don't have it yet, how are they going to house all of their kids? They run into all of these kind of configurations for grades that are forced by the housing, and so you do the best you can with it. Um, but the middle school plan was an actual plan, came out of the Bridgewaters, I believe, and um, I like it, grade five through eight. But everybody got nervous when you first do it, and is the fifth graders going to fit with the eighth graders and all of that? Well, you have old-fashioned grammar schools something like my little one-room schoolhouse on the island if I had more, a few more bodies in it. Um, had kids going to the same school from grade one to grade eight. I didn't hear anybody talking like they couldn't manage it, you know? Mm -hmm. Kids, the eighth graders don't usually beat up first graders. So, you know, it just doesn't happen. If there's a, yeah. So, um, I, I don't think it's as big a problem as it's made out to be, but most middle schools still have some division, fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth, and how much they actually do do together and how much they do separate. And so the same thing can be done with the eighth grade, how much they do with the rest of the high school and how much they do separate. Biggest togetherness is probably on school buses for those kids who ride them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, schools like uh, West Bridgewater <coughs> have a planned high school that go goes from grade seven to twelve. Mm. So, I don't, and they've had it for years, and I think they're building a new one that's going to do the same thing. So, it can't be a raging failure, you know. It's just that it's a change that people aren't used to, and um, they get a little bit nervous about older kids mixing with younger kids and you're going to taint them somehow. Sometimes they're just big helpers. Um, sometimes older kids on buses don't put up with some of the junk that younger kids would pull off and so it's a help rather than a hindrance. So I don't have a major problem with it, it's just a change and everybody has to get used to it. And then on the other side of the fence, you want to know what's going on behind the walls when it actually does happen, that it's uh, everything is running smoothly and well, and haven't let something get away that uh, would be a problem. Obviously, a decision that comes down to the school committee, right? <clears throat> yes. Did you experience a lot of headaches with the school committee, trying to pass over the things? course of uh, thirty-nine years? Uh, most of the time, not. Uh, most of the time, um, well, the early years I didn't have to work with the school committee directly all that much anyway. The opportunity wasn't there. The superintendent did it and the 
principles and whatever. And in the early days, I was only called in. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was called in by Mr. Roy a couple of times when we were trying to uh, increase our programming, and uh, therefore it took increased budget and whatever. And uh, so I could. He, it was nice he invited me in to do my own sales pitch and to talk with the school committee about it and conserve I would say it was a conservative group of uh, mostly men at that time but um, <clears throat> it went okay and um, over all of the years it's it's uh, gone pretty well um, uh, at one point in my career it got a little bit dicey and um, it was too bad. I don't think it really had to, but you can't control everybody. You can only control yourself. Yeah. Were uh, negotiations of fine with teachers <clears throat> also like the school committee? Or, you know? Negotiations is a is another whole topic. You know where you want to take it, <laughs> um, because it's a social topic for everybody in town and everybody everywhere. Whether they're you know. It's easy to divide the world, or at least it was easy. We're not quite so much a manufacturing country anymore. But that whole, you know, are you for labor, are you for your management, are you, you know, that kind of thing. Well, mostly if it's viewed as um, we're in this to get the job done well, and we have to know that everybody from top to bottom wants a decent pay. They want to they wanna be able to live a decent life. And that, that's mostly what's under the bargaining thing. There aren't too many program issues and stuff like that that are under the bargaining issue. And I've been the president of the Teachers Association at Titan Rehoboth and did the bargaining on the teacher's side of the table. Uh, so I understand that pretty well. And I've been superintendent of the schools and did the bargaining on the management side of the table. It isn't too different on either side of the table. Uh, Everybody plays a certain amount of gamesmanship in the bargaining situation. And um, you try to do the best you can to be honest with everybody and, and um, trade ideas and trade proposals and try to come to agreements that uh, not only both of those teams can buy, but you think the community's going to buy. And... Uh, and I know for some people, what people are going to buy when they go back home. Uh, you mean you didn't get a raise again this year? You know, um, <laughs> or um, whoopee, we got a raise. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so, anyway, bargaining is a is a whole practice. And, um, Did you have a varied group of people you worked with? Yep. <coughs> men and women and older people and younger people, about as mixed as we get in the countryside here. I mean, we're not ethnically, uh, well, we are ethnically kind of mixed, you know. We got all kinds of countries we came from, you know, at one time or another. Or, or old Yankees that have been here so long they forget they came from England or somewhere before. <laughs> um, but yeah, quite a uh, quite a mix, and people with uh, quite a lot of experience, and people with begin beginners. I hired a lot of beginners, found a lot of good people. It was, uh, it was one of the fun parts of my job, and yet um, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough, both here and uh, and in the other towns, um, on two or three occasions, to be able to go hire the expert you needed. I uh, couldn't do that all the time. Sometimes just couldn't afford to do it, and so you had to buy somebody that was going to grow into it. But there was two or three times during my career, which I still smile on, that we really needed somebody with all of the, all of the pieces to be able to put in place and have things be better. And um, I was able to do that. It was wonderful. Were uh, things easy picking staff members, or would you say it was difficult Excuse because me. of the level of education and uh, quality that you needed to teach kids? Uh, most of the times, that's not the bigger problem. Most of the time is is um, 
being able to follow your hunches on who's going to actually fit in the spot and do a good job. So obviously you don't leave out credentials. So, But credentials come pretty much on paper. You can shuffle the pile until you have the preferences on, and then you gotta you gotta have some hunches about what you see on paper, and then you have some hunches after you actually interview people, and then um, if you're doing it alone, in some ways it's easier because you can go with your own hunch. If you're doing it, if you're doing it in a team, sometimes you have to match hunches with other people around the table. And everybody compromises until you choose one, unless there's an obvious one to sort of stick out of the barrel. And then um, sometimes teaming works well, choosing a candidate. And sometimes there's so much compromising that goes on that um, you might not even get the best candidate. Did teachers, did they change with the times, or were they more apt to hold to their traditions of teaching, or ways of teaching? Well, I, I thought about that a little bit, I guess. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's a whopping big difference in all of the time I've been teaching. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of fine tuning been done, but there's a lot that's still very similar. That's why everybody thinks they know exactly what's going on in teaching. And in lots of ways, they're right, because there's still a classroom, a teacher, uh, kids in a classroom, and, um, and there's presentations made, sometimes a little fancier, sometimes not quite so fancy, sometimes the lecture method, sometimes we're all going to draw, sometimes we're gonna, all going to write. Some. So um, sometimes change is a little more difficult when it's behavioral change, and uh, we all have some uh, difficulty with some behavioral change. Sometimes change is so fast and all around you and on top of you and you actually change quickly without sort of much uh, trouble. Um, everybody's different in that regard too. Um, uh, some people engulfed the computer uh, age sort of so much that they were became uh, the, the local um, uh, computer specialist uh, because they were way ahead of everybody else uh, around them who were slower at doing it. Uh, some people even uh, even now uh, have as little to do with it as possible because it either doesn't fit their style or every time they touch electronics it don't work or they push the wrong button. They need to call in the five-year-old in the, in the neighborhood and they'll hit the right buttons for you. Uh, so it's um, there's more involvement with uh, all of that uh, that's been forced on almost all professions. Um, special needs teachers write IEPs on computers. Um, became necessary. People working all day and then writing IEPs all night. Um, and um, computers were able to, you know, make that a little bit slicker and a little bit better. Uh, not right away. My wife was a teacher too. Uh, teacher in another town, um, and when computers first came to their special ed program to do IEPs, they gave them, you know, one computer for four or five teachers. Didn't work. Obviously, didn't work very well. Uh, somebody was there till eleven o'clock at night trying to get their use of their computer time. Um, so there's lots. Sometimes there's a lot more to whatever it is than meets the eye. Like you know. You mean you had trouble having those teachers, you know, switch over to uh, doing a computer for the IEPs? Well, the answer could be yes, but part of the trouble was there was, wasn't enough computers. Yeah. <laughs> and so it wasn't so much that the teachers wouldn't play the game or wouldn't do their thing, but it's just uh, availability. Um, so many things are very similar, except when there's a whole... Uh, change in subject area or uh, something. Are you moving, you know, even history during our time? They used to talk about when I was in school about, you know, never getting past World War I or, or not getting to World War I. Uh, and nowadays, you know, if you s say that, you'll never cover World War I and World War II, you know. But 
then I heard for another period of time, so many kids that never heard of Vietnam. You know, somehow, somehow we all think that during our time isn't history, but <laughs> half, at least half of my life is history to you, <laughs> and uh, it was just part of my life. You know, so um, I, I don't, I don't think change is uh, an enormous problem. I, uh, I think people will change when they're provided with the lessons and with what they need to do to make the change. And um, the success of change will be like I've said many times, and you can tell I'm the special needs guy. I mean, you just, you know, if people can't draw, they're not going to very well at all. They're not going to choose that medium to show off. They're not going to even want to do uh, their work in that realm. Um, Instead, they'll be looking at computers from another way so they can grab all of these images off, off the internet and put them in their story instead of, you know, hand, hand drawing them or something. So all of those things um, are different with everybody, and if you can take all of that into the mix and not expect them to do stuff they're not comfortable with, then most of it goes okay. When you needed to make a change or demand something of the teachers, did they comply even if they didn't want to? Yeah, they, uh, they work hard. And um, in, a general, in a general sense about teachers is they try like heck to do all of those kinds of things they're supposed to do um, on a whole. Everybody does um, if they're supposed to. The only, the only thing I probably had a little bit of struggle with, for, and um, it just doesn't happen much today either, is uh, certain, certain teachers, special needs teachers being one of them, but, um, I, I wanted them to do home visits and um, get to know the families from home. And um, some did it and did it well and liked it and even, and some others um, really had a thing about not doing it, and um, even somebody somebody with it in a job description uh, met it in different ways. They usually uh, wasn't their favorite thing to do. But other than that, uh, most every but everybody's tried to, and and in some cases, you know, if you're in an administrative spot and you have a you're supervising a lot of people, sometimes you just stand back and you go, "Wow, somebody is really great." Or a whole team of people are really doing wonderful stuff, and you didn't even have to kick them. You didn't have to prod them. You didn't have to do any of that. They're just doing a great job. What your job is then, pat them on the back. <laughs> tell them they're doing a good job and you know it. Uh, and uh, tell other people they're doing a good job. Uh, because there are many people doing very good work. Um, what would you say is the hardest thing you have to do over the years as an administrator? Um, in my business, the hardest thing was um, uh, using the uh, negative process of uh, appeal and hearings. Um, when parents and the school system disagree about educational plans, um, you can do a lot within the system to try to um, satisfy that, talk it out, have different people who get along with each other better or something, talk with each other and try to do whatever you can do to, to find out why the parent don't like it and what you could do about it. Uh, teach the parent why the youngster needs it, uh, all of that stuff. But in the end, there, uh, everywhere I've been, there's always been one or two over a seven year period or something that um, I guess it's why the appeal process is there. I guess it's why the hearing process is there and it's a quasi court and um, everybody runs and either gets advocates or lawyers and uh, you go into battle about this kid's ed plan. It's lousy. It doesn't feel like education. It doesn't feel like a um, homegrown um, family issue. It feels like courtroom. And um, people make accusations. Uh, the opposing lawyers have to make a, or advocates have to make a, 
uh, accusation that the teacher doesn't know what she's doing and, and you know, the teacher's sitting there and supposed to take that, you know, like you see the, they uh, take it on courtroom and TV. <laughs> they just rub off their back. No, no, that person goes home and f either falls apart, feels terrible, or would like to kill somebody because they've just been called either a moron or they don't know what they're doing or something, and they're a professional person. Um, so those, the hearings I've been involved in, very few, but they were terrible. The getting to the hearing and after the hearing and the telephone calls and meeting with people in the office when it's ugly, it's terrible. Looking at the schools you managed and taught at and the schools now, did you see a big difference in growth? Are the schools larger now? Yeah, they're definitely larger. Um, there was uh, North Rehoboth School and uh, Pleasant Street School and Anawan School and uh, Palmer River School. And then uh, along came Beckwith School. And then uh, they closed down uh, North and South Schools and then eventually Anawan School and built Palmer River bigger and built an addition onto Beckwith School. So the little schools disappeared uh, and the two bigger schools grew. And um, so that's an obvious change for those of us who have been here uh, over that brief period of time. Before that, there was a whole string of one-room schools in town and uh, that was before my time. So the schools get bigger and the town got bigger. Uh, we're almost twice the population uh, that it was or when I came to town and um, I moved to town a year after I started teaching here and um, so town's twice as big it's not surprised that the schools are bigger uh, and they also changed from having many I personally probably would have just as soon see another elementary school as have Palmer River be as big as it is but it's functioning. It's doing a good job as far as I know. Um, what was a typical day for you like? I know the classes were smaller, so you probably got to know a lot of kids better. Yeah, it, 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 uh, my first job at Palmer River um, was like a, I used to call it somewhat like a little Boy Scout troop or whatever, because it was just guys and it was uh, half a dozen and um, and it was a do-everything classroom, like, more like elementary school teachers, all the rest of, you know, you do everything all day. Um, and uh, there wasn't much for specialists, uh, so uh, I did everything. Um, I was the gym teacher and the art teacher, and, uh, and uh, if we sang anything, it was us, and it was, um, so... We were together all day. There wasn't much of anything called a break other than uh, there was some recess time, but I had to watch out for that a little bit too with the age and size of the kids and all of that. So um, there, was, there was gym and stuff and we played games in the backfield. And uh, it was, uh, we, put up, we put up a couple of new uh, pieces of playground equipment that ended up being sawed down, but in fact, everything we added to the Palmer River playground where it back then got sawed down. <laughs> um, and uh, some of that became timely because enough years went by. Some of it was because people viewed it as dangerous. If somebody fell off of one and lost their breath for a few minutes, next thing you know, they're sawing the thing down. So I don't know if they sawed down all the apple trees in the kids' backyard, but they sawed down the playground equipment at Palmer River for a while now. And, uh, I can remember wearing a fairly new suit to school once and playing uh, uh, Capture the Flag or something along those lines out, out in back of Palmer River and running through the woods and falling down and, and uh, putting a big hole in my new suit. <laughs> That was, that was when I was young and foolish, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, at the high school, the day was more like high, a little more like you know high school teacher's schedule, and um, um, if everybody was uh, to a gym or something like that, then uh, 
I might have a little prep time. Um, and most of that I used um, in some cases um, working with the folks in the vocational school because some of my kids would be able to be there a little bit part time and and we ended up in, uh, integrating a few kids into some of the high school classes, but that was harder because of the uh, the stretch between their um, where they were at was usually more like an elementary level of um, even though it was functional, it wasn't uh, always up to being able to be integrated in high school programs except for things like gym and art and some of those other things that don't demand that you can you know, read 10th grade level or something. So if you're reading at 5th grade level, you're pretty functional. You can read the paper and everything. The newspapers are built on that, but not necessarily a science textbook. Yeah. Were the students helpful in their transition in between classes for those who got to participate? Yeah, most, uh, most of the uh, students and teachers, uh, all teachers, uh, I would say, um, Maybe a couple of exceptions of people that wondered if we belonged there, but for the most part, uh, all teachers and um, and 99% of the students. Um, we did have a, a little bit of struggle with a few students that um, I used to say weren't far from being in the same boat, um, where, where we got the most trouble. We'd never get any trouble for most of the kids that were high-flying kids doing their thing. And, uh, but for some reason or other, I think it's a thing of life. The people that are closest to it are usually the ones that are cranking about it, and the ones that are furthest away from it um, get the idea and um, maybe even have some sympathy and be helpful. Yeah. Mm. So it's typical of what you think life is. Were your kids given a lot of freedom in school? No. <laughs> Uh, actually, no. Um, kids in general uh, didn't get a heck of a lot of freedom in school. Um, when I when I first came to uh, Palmer River, one of the concerns was that my kids had, uh, for my classroom, had too much freedom. They uh, they were helpful to the custodians, and they uh, and they were um, gad about schools, about the school, but. Most people were concerned because they were too much gad about the school and um, everybody treated them fine and all of that, but they were just, um, so in some ways I did a good job by keeping my kids in the classroom. Uh, and so freedom is not, you know, is not probably the right word. I, I think in a special needs program you have to um, offer a certain amount of um, flexibility in the classroom itself, but I don't call that, you know, just freedom um, to just, you know, hobnob around the, uh, no. And at the high school, uh, my friend Joe Harrington was principal of that high school, and that high school was uh, well run and, um, and not a place of uh, flopping around with uh, freedom that was un in any thought uncontrollable. Um, wouldn't wouldn't exist <laughs> um, couldn't exist we'd all be on it it was part of the uh part of the um, atmosphere of the of Dyton-Rehoboth Regional High School and well known <laughs> were the kids uh, disciplined a lot for their you said they'd not they'd not harass <coughs> the custodians but no, they didn't have, they were helpful to custodians most of the time, and that was at Palmer River. At the high school, they didn't get involved in the same way at all. Um, just didn't get started that way at all. But at Palmer River School, um, you know, they did helpful things. You know, if it was time to put all those chairs out in that uh, cafetorium there and uh, uh, for a program or something, then kids would all help put all those chairs out. That was very helpful. There was nothing sort of wrong about it. It's just that in between sometimes the kids would say they needed to go help the custodians when they hadn't really planned ahead for it or anything like that. And, mm. and so they'd be hobnobbing up and down the corridor when they shouldn't have been or something. So that happened. I'm not sure because I wasn't there all the time, but it happened enough to, so that when I kept them in the room the following year, they, 
I got some kind of accolades about just keeping them from roaming. So, mm. yeah. so they were good kids all in all, not a lot of disciplinary problems? No. No. One of the, over the course of time, and I'll just be quick about this, but over the course of time, one of the programs uh, that we added, especially uh, all the way from elementary school through high school, was programs that help kids with uh, behavioral issues. Mm. And um, so some psychology involved, some behavior specialist teaches, and uh, uh, behavior programming, and, uh, and uh, counseling, and all of, all of that was p as part of, uh, you know, why, is, why are these youngsters of any age having such a difficulty with their behavior? And some of it ranges from medical uh, to um, psychiatric, and you, um, you try to make an approach at making their life better. And, making consults and helping to uh, help their parents with that. Because most of the time, if there's a real problem with that, everybody's having the problem. Kids themselves are having a problem. Parents are having a problem. Teachers are having a problem. And so once it's diagnosed that that's a real problem and not just somebody being a wise guy for this afternoon, but if they have a real problem, then um, it's one of the toughest things to deal with, one of the toughest things to fix, and one of the toughest programs to have um, people feel good about because everybody is somewhat afraid of it. You know, it's just like the rest of life. You don't want to hear that somebody that's uh, kind of a rogue or something is moving next door to you. You know, you, everybody gets a little nervous, and so when you find out that you have a program for those kids in this, you know, six or ten kids there, people get nervous until they're working with the specialists that work with them and um, find out what really happens, and hopefully things go well. But somebody's got to face those kind of issues. Yeah. Were there any problems with other kids? Uh, saying things to your uh, the special education children? No. I, you know, there was only a little incidence of that that I know of, and it's not a great big problem, but there is some problem about it once in a while. Uh, but it's certainly not a big problem, and it's very selective. And One of my memories for that is, is very old. It goes back, uh, <clears throat> you know, 50 years and so. Um, and then there's smaller things about it. Right now, all of the schools everywhere, because the media, for one thing, is pushing it. Uh, uh, we got everybody talking about bullying. Well, yeah, so does anybody ever, you know, give a kid a tough time? I don't care if he's got a special ed label, doesn't have a special ed label. Um, anybody ever give anybody a tough time? Yeah, they do. Now, what's called bullying to the extent that you're going to have to you know, pull in all of the resources from every every place, and or do you just talk to two kids and and get something? You know, get it to stop, just like you would at home if some older brother's bullying his younger brother or something. You gotta you gotta step in and do something about it, and most of the time it works. So right now I feel a little bit itchy about the bullying thing because everything I look at now I still get professional magazines and stuff to come across the desk and plus what you read in the newspaper and they're always banging lately everything's this bullying thing except you think all of the kids everywhere were you know on every school bus there was a major issue or something mm, yeah I don't believe it <laughs> I, I just don't think it's that level of a problem I think it's a problem when it happens but I don't think that you know this world is falling apart because everybody's bullying. It's overdone somehow. Um, well, how was uh, transitioning into computers? You had mentioned that earlier with um, people <coughs> writing up papers. Well, <coughs> to be honest with you, I'm probably <coughs> excuse me, just old enough uh, that I didn't live through a whole lot of the computer stuff that's right up to right now. I got first grader <coughs> and a second grader on Cuddy Hunk Island. They both have they both have school laptops. 
uh, and they use them. And um, uh, I see that as a, as a change. The teacher is already a laptop user, so that one seems easy for me. And we also provide uh, a specialist that came from huh, being a specialist in this school system, Ray Medeiros, who's doing some consulting for us there and, and helping us. Um, so one thing is just the computers and the other thing is sort of everything that goes with it. Do you have a decent operating website? Why do you have one? Is it functional? Do people even use it? Do they go to it? They, and when they go to it, do they see anything that's up to date or do they see stuff from 1909? Uh, you know, what what's going on with every piece of it? Um, and um, then the internet use and all of that. For simple... For the in-classroom use, everybody hasn't gotten to furnish all students with, with some kind of a device. Now we're getting into iPads that are a little cheaper to do. Um, then you do the whole classroom sets for some places, and some other places don't have any. It's, it's um, I don't know, it's, it's a very complicated thing about initiating the technology stuff because... Some school systems are now saying, bring your own. Whatever the kids got, bring it. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, there's a nice administrative nightmare for you. Um, can you give the same assignment to all the kids? Can they, can they either go get it off the Internet? Or have you put it up there in the first place? Is it something that you customized, or is it something that was purchased? Is the system purchasing those for everybody? Uh, and, and everyone that you get? can be read by whatever the kid brings, whether it's an Apple product, whether it's a PC product, whether it's a whether it's an iPad or whether it's I I think those kinds of things are absolute nightmares. Mm -hmm. If you can say, can all of those kids use all of their own devices for homework or something and they're gonna turn in a printed page? Mm -hmm. Sure. You don't care how it's developed. You don't care which machine it's developed on or anything like that. But if you're gonna put program up that is a lesson, somehow it better be equally be able to be gotten by everybody. And so until you're ready to do that, that's a problem. State of Maine started putting in computers to, to uh, like all of a whole grade across the state. And then they have to follow up the next year and the next year and the next year and produce, to, to get to everybody. And I, I don't know if they've gotten to everybody yet, but until you're going to get to everybody, I think it's a major issue. <coughs> I think it's a major issue about a lot of things if you don't get to everybody. <laughs> Pardon me. <coughs> How was uh, the earlier transition into computers? Uh, some, most of it was administrative. Mm -hmm. um, some people had to you know, turn in attendances and things like that. Uh, uh, or you're doing budgets, or you're doing um, uh, financial stuff in the office and all that kind of thing. That was, and then the other thing was people using uh, as word processors, and, and uh, none of that was a outstanding issue or problem. You just in the early stages, you just couldn't make it a, a demand because you everybody didn't have stuff at home. Mm. And now, like I just said, I, you have to submit to. If you make it a demand, can you put you know, everybody raise their hand? Can I, can I get to a device? You know. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's one in the library. The ten kids gonna go down there tonight? They're all gonna use it at the same time? You know, there's uh, five at the library or ten. Um, is everybody gonna take home one out of the school library? Uh, I don't, at which way do you know that you can actually get that accomplished? You know, or, or are you gonna give a time frame that's long? And then assume that they can find one over time, mm. but um, and so the same things existed before. You just couldn't demand as much earlier because there wasn't as much of it around. Uh, and the very early things, you know, we were doing card punch up at DI High School for things like attendance. Had a big, had a big piece, a big computer, uh, as big as this fireplace, or bigger, uh, and you do a card sort machine. All of that, uh, uh, doing a graduate course at Rhode Island College and computers, and they talked like you had to learn how to program the computer. 
How, ma how many of all of us that use the computer today are programming the computer? Not many. You know, we know how to drive it. It's like a car. You know, how many of us are the mechanic? Not many, uh, but we all drive one. And the computer's almost the same. We're all driving computers, but, you know, how many uh, can actually uh, program the dumb thing? Hmm. <coughs> so, in the early days, they all talked like we all had to learn how to program the computer. So they lost a whole bunch of people right there uh, that uh, knew that, you know, if they knew enough about it, they knew that time is coming when the programs are going to be done, you know, and we're just going to drive this thing. But early on, it scared a whole bunch of us to death about, you know, yeah, you learn, you learn some basics like it's all pluses and minuses. The little gates open. It's all one and two, a one, zero and one, zero and one, zero and one. That's the whole thing is built that way. So now the next step is you're gonna, you're gonna start programming this thing. <laughs> Most of us, aren't, you know, weren't gonna go there. So we went from card, card punch and attendance and all that kind of thing to some basic um, using it to write letters and stuff. Secretaries uh, didn't have to, you know, use the whiteout so much and, <laughs> and do it over again so it would look nice and clean. Yeah. So it's obviously something that's going to have to progress even further. It's going to have to progress work. even further, and it, you know, and it's a big financial um, issue, even though, you know, all of that electronic stuff, the price keeps coming down. But at the same time, they keep coming out with something new. It's a lot to keep up to. Yeah. Would you say the computers have helped the use of paper in school or not? I, I, I don't know. I've never done a study about it. But I'm one that in general thinks that um, computers have helped to generate as much paper as they have helped to save paper. Everybody wants a copy. Everybody's got a copy machine in their house now because they've got a printer. And they've got a multifunction printer. Uh, and... So where you used to write one letter, one page, uh, use the whiteout, and then send it. Now you can give the copy to everybody who want, ever thought they wanted one, 10 of them, like nothing, 10 more pages. Everybody's got another copy. Every meeting you go to, whether it's at church or wherever it is, everybody's got to have a copy. It didn't happen before. It didn't, you know. So I kind of think that there's as much paper generated now as there was. Here and there, when you use an email, you maybe didn't send a note. So you sent email. Who says the guy at the other end, don't print it? In fact, sometimes you're expected to print it. Um, sometimes you want to print it because now you want to scribble on it. And the... So I think there's probably as much paper tonnage going on as, as, uh, as there was before. Could you explain to the mimeograph? For all those who don't know. <laughs> well, the, the, that has to do with all this copying stuff. And, and it's actually uh, two or three kinds of machines. But the liquid duplicator is the one that I think is the most remembered. It's the ones that, that had the liquid on the paper that everybody smelled. Then there was a Mimeo that was more like a small printing machine that actually ink came onto the paper. But it but it didn't dry very fast and it was smudgy and you had to watch out for that. And then uh, copy machines came along. And there's, a, there's another one that's a fancy kind of uh, Mimeo machine. Um, can't think of the name of it right this minute. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> um, the, the liquid duplicator was, <laughs> you know, they were all over every school. You had a, you had a can of the liquid <laughs> and all of the papers and the little machine go <laughs> right you do 25 copies every every teacher 25 or 30 copies <laughs> and then um, you know yeah and they were all purple uh, purple ink and purple masters and they could get a little messy on occasion um, and if you passed out the papers right away quick they were damp and uh, famous famous uh, machine and the, the Mimeo machine um, and its uh, cousin, you had, you had masters and you had to pull them down and get, get all the ink all over everything and it had to be really careful not to have a big mess around the people. Some secretaries had gloves and whatever and they, it was just a, 
easy to get into a nice ink mess, uh, and ink don't come out. So you're supposed to be dressed half decently and uh, all of that, and then get ink all over everything. And nowadays, it's more of an <clears throat> issue of how many copies of which type. So you go to the copy machine up to about 25 copies, and then after that, you should go to a print type machine. <coughs> I know they, most of those were called risograph machines. And um, <coughs> you go to one of those, and you make up a, you make up a master, and then you print them out, uh, 100 of them, 200 of them, 300 of them, and those will be a qu quarter of a cent, whereas the copies will be a couple of cents a piece. So you're supposed to do up to about 25 on the copy machine, unless you got one of these big commercial copy machines, and then, then you don't switch over. You just do what you need. Thank goodness for the copy machine now. Yeah, yeah. You know, all the teachers and all the administrators, they're all sort of in the printing business. You know, the printing guys down the road don't, we don't want to hear that, but, you know, they're printing stuff every day uh, mm. in, in one form or another. They definitely make it difficult, though. <laughs> um, so, from your memories of the schools, what what do you remember about the dress code, exactly? Well, dress codes in a public school, uh, basically, is you go looking to, you know, like you're ready to do some work. Um, you don't want to look like you just walked out of the barnyard or, the, or out of the play field or you just slid into third base and... And you don't want to look like you haven't changed your clothes in a month. But um, so you want to, you know, school clothes. Everybody used to talk about school clothes. You know, I think everybody kind of understood what, what that was. Uh, nowadays, everybody likes, a lot of people like to stretch that. Uh, times have changed a bit. Guys went to, guys went to teach school in uh, shirts and ties and jackets. Mm -hmm. um, that's gone away. We're into, uh, first we went to no tie, and now we're into golf shirts, and, um, you know, hope we don't get into Saturday paint shirts. But, you know, if, we, if we're looking like the golf course or, um, or an evening out that's not a uh, formal evening out or something, then uh, most people are safe, uh, and kids included. It's when, it's when the people who way back then and all the way up to now want to test whether there's a rule or not or test that uh, am I so flamboyant I'm going to catch a lot of attention all right. Uh, is somebody going to have the guts to tell me that uh, this isn't really appropriate school clothes? A public school hasn't had a, a dress code dress code or that uh, has been very strong. Goes back, uh, back at the, back in the '60s, there was a time there when you know, uh, boy G uh, George there in, the, uh, in his haircuts and uh, for guys and girls, whether the mini skirts were going to get too short, um, all all went through uh, a time. But they sort of still go through a time and. Um, Everybody wished that somebody could do uh, something about the extremes, but most people don't live in the extremes, so you're not having trouble with everybody in the whole, in a whole school. But you have some concern about uh, whether school school clothes are appropriate for school work, which is similar to office work. Which it, you just you just don't go looking like uh, you're either at the beach or or the uh, or at a uh, party somewhere that's uh, a pool party. I don't know, something that looks like you don't have enough clothes on one way or another uh, to go to work. And uh, so that kind, of a, that kind of a thing or something that's so odd that everybody's going to look at it and then somebody's either going to complain that they're being bullied because somebody made a comment about this odd thing they're wearing you know, which came first in that case, you know. <laughs> if there was nothing odd to be looked at or said something about, maybe they'd find something else to say something about, or maybe they wouldn't, because you didn't wear a flag <laughs> and say, yeah, look at this. 
I bet you wouldn't dare to wear this. <laughs> so, and I'm, I'm not too fond of uh, public schools uh, talking about uh, extremes of dress code being uh, uh, uniforms uh, either. Uh, I don't, you know, all the places that do uniforms do them for their reasons, and I haven't heard anybody dying because they wore a uniform, but uh, I don't. I don't think public schools have to be uniformized, you know. Mm. You like my, that. my feeling, some other people can think that that's the answer to all their discipline problems and all of that, and I submit to you, no. And I've gone to school not with, but next to schools that uh, had dress codes like that in uh, parochial schools. And sometimes you kind of snicker because they were supposed to wear a tie. Yeah, well, then they wore striped ties with paisley shirts and whatever else, and flannel shirts with crazy ties, and you know, you don't, you wonder if they, <laughs> if they were helping the cause, you know, or if it just was another way to be different. And so, in order to be different, they had to make their uniform look stupid. <laughs> Do you remember? Um do you remember when girls had to kneel down when they wore skirts? You had mentioned something earlier about mini skirts. Yeah, yeah off camera we did. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah. Way back then there was a um, there was a, a time when the the uh, I guess it was the dean of girls and the and the principal were uh, checking girls out because. The skirts were getting too short. They were getting up above the knee. And so the way to measure whether they were at the knee or not was they, a few kids, I guess, had to kneel to the floor and uh, see if the skirt touched. Um, and that was the way you measured. Um, so there was, you know, there was some hoop de la about that for a while, but like all clothes items, things slowly changed over the course of time. But there was, argument about, you know, whether the principal of the school could have any say on what the kids wore or not. There again, it was all about extremes and pushing the envelope. And so uh, one of my, uh, one of my longtime uh, colleagues in this school system that was a great school superintendent for a lot of years, there was only two, Robert T. Roy and Joseph Harrington, and Joseph Harrington was principal of the the uh, high school at that time, and uh, and went through the throes of that kind of issue, um, and uh, you know the fact that that had some negative connotations is too bad. The overall school was running like a clock, and Joe always did a good job and uh, became a good superintendent, and uh, but. Uh, Controversy over hair and and skirts, famous. It's too bad because it sounds like, from what you say, it sounds like he did a good job with the school. Oh yeah, and I, but he, you know, he he was the figurehead at the time, and so he 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 sometimes was blamed by people for making it a little bit more than it needed to be. But mm. you know, we did a lot of things very well in that school. And uh, he was the leader. He just did what he thought it was right. Do you have any more memories of the school that you'd like to share? Oh man, <clears throat> there's a lot of a lot of things. I wanted to mention Joe before I got got through with this because uh, of his long time uh, good input into the schools. Um, the only thing that probably in a special needs uh, realm that I didn't we haven't talked about because it, it didn't come up, but it's because they didn't get to it in the expansion of programming and things. But um, we uh, we were very active as, um, uh, from Dighton Rehoboth and uh, by me, um, especially in the South Coast Collaborative, now known as the South Coast Collaborative, it was established pretty much uh, out of Dighton Rehoboth, and I went and got. Uh, the other school systems to join in and become um, what was known as cooperative production collaborative at that time. 
and then later on it got changed when um, when the state made a change in who had to be the uh, executive directors and they uh, we had a unique thing when it started that businessmen uh, sc school people um, administrators and, and some representative parents who were all made up the board of directors and then mm. the state came along and said that it all had to be superintendents of schools and at that time um, we changed um, South Coast Coll Collaborative um, became the name of that collaborative and shortly thereafter we separated um, cooperative production from South Coast and South Coast served kids and school systems and cooperative production serves adults. So we started that thing. It's a big thing. It serves kids who uh, you only have one that needs this and one that needs that and so instead of having very expensive programs serving one or two kids. By the time you put three or four school districts together, you can now serve, you know, six or eight or ten kids and uh, do it with a little bit more expertise and, uh, and, uh, and, and certainly um, uh, more efficiently financially. And the other one uh, that we formed similar to that, uh, Mr. Roy was uh, involved in a group of superintendents that were looking at starting a that um, p uh, PCC program, uh, pretty much for kids that did very well in school. And um, <coughs> so Mr. Roy and I made a presentation with a couple of other uh, school districts about um, when the special ed law was coming in, 766, there was a big worry about how much into the medical world when we were talking about having to diagnose kids right away they were worried about how far we're going to get in the medical world and how much expense is that going to be and all of that and so um, the group of superintendents that were doing uh, PCC ended up separating everybody who wanted to all the school systems who wanted to and we established the Reeds Collaborative that operates out of uh, their offices are in Middleborough but they serve all of us in Taunton and Middleborough and uh, down towards the Cape, and uh, we we established a uh, a medical and diagnostic cl uh, clinic that included included a medical uh, wing. Uh, so uh, it's about the only one in the state, and it still exists, and it does a good job. And then they added some programming, like uh, programming for deaf children. And so uh, Dykeman Hobbit was very active in establishing those two collaboratives that they still belong to and still serves our, still serve our kids. So, I think, I don't know what else except if I got together with two or three or four other old people from the school district, we could reminisce for three days. Mm -hmm.